The most delicate cup of Darjeeling tea that I've ever had was poured out by Manik Dai himself late one morning at one Bishop Lefroy Road. When I had asked him where I should see him, he said, come over, it's Bishop Lefroy Road. And I did not quite follow it till he said, it's like La Croix in French. So uh, that's where I went. This was 40 years and more ago. And as he held the white porcelain in his warm hand, he asked, milk? A spot, perhaps, I said, and a spot it was. Hardly discernible was the dissolution of the molecules of milk in the tea. Just like his work, as with the mid-range tones in bounced light. When I had the first sip, I exclaimed that it was exquisite. He said, smiling, it is from a particular garden in Darjeeling, where he had set a short story of his. It comes as a gift, regularly. Like the rain every year, the rain in which the pubescent Durga drenched herself, Yes, like the sonata, the form that he borrowed from Western music to structure his narrative, moving from the original binary to a third stream of consciousness. The third stream of consciousness is reached through a return, which is nevertheless an ascension to be rounded off by reconciling counterpoints into a single melody. It is so full, this form, that it sometimes can do without a coda, but is sometimes uh, easily uh, rounded off by Koda, by a kind of statement of the entire thing together. Of course, I knew none of this when I was given a ticket some 65 years ago to go and see Pathar Panchali. The show was at Nas Cinema, where all the sharks of Bombay of that time had offices. They were in the business of making films, of importing and exporting, and had worldwide contacts with the kind of people that I did not particularly like to know or ever meet. Except later, of course, not at school, when I had to look for money. Instead, I loved getting drenched too every monsoon, every year, especially when I was a little older than Durga and wanted to get away from this concrete jungle called Bombay. So when I saw the film, Pater Panchali, it was, a, it was a kind of first time. I had never known a landscape as lush as that of Bengal nor the silver screen's representation of its green gold shrubs and trees, nor had I heard such bird sounds in any other film that I had seen. Those bird sounds that touch you when trains halt midway between stations. Yeah. Those kind of sounds which make you wonder at the beauty of nature. Yes, music was all around, even in Bombay, all, all around in the atmosphere. And before Bombay, where uh, 
I was born in Larkana in Sindh. Music was there of the highest quality. Through days and nights on crowded streets, in cozy corners, or sometimes from the distance, in the solitude of one's own room. Concerts by the pandits and ustads could be attended by paying just one rupee. Thus, I had heard the alaps of Ravi Shankar as well, who was the music director of Pater Panchali. I did not hear or know then that in the Western tradition there are structures which work in time as a sequence, like our four-part Drupad does. The Drupad, you know, has the Astai, the Antara, the Sanchari, and then you have the Abhog, which is more like Moksha. And that part of it, the fourth part, uh, began to disappear, I think, from Western music uh, around the time that Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven created its classical forms. It also shows that in the ethical system, as Europe Christianized itself further, and as it also simultaneously built the economy which uh, brought about what we consider to be the contemporary democracies, it had given up the idea of grace or was trying to, uh, trying to find another mode of spiritual um, self-realization. Now, for us to adopt those kind of modes of thought in our music, in our narratology, in this form of storytelling, characterization, we had to rediscover our own forms. I think that was started in um, Bengal by Tagore himself. And uh, it must have had a lasting effect on almost everybody uh, in India. And this was then absorbed by Manikta in a very curious way. I'm told that uh, when he was doing the uh, music for Pater Panchali at the recording itself, he did it. That is, he constructed something of that architecture by whistling. Now, it's really quite remarkable that one could uh, begin, uh, for instance, the titles with Pakhavich, uh, and then whistle one's way through to the light motif. So he whistled, that's what I'm told. And apparently Ravi Shankar went on to elaborate the composition while Shubhrata Mitra rendered it on the sitar. I hear this from impeccable sources. But there was a difference in the sense that there was a kind of reference in that architecture to the purely Indian tradition. 
what else can one call the Pakavaj or the Mridang? It was uh, with that that the announcement of syllabic progression would take place, that is in language or in music. The title music of Adhar Panchali, starting with it, is quite an indication of how our thought processes were structured. Um, can the palpable accord of any resonance survive? I wonder. Can it stand on its own in all its fragility? The British Empire had tasted its own transient and fragile existence at the Boston Tea Party. But it went on to survive here for more than a century thereafter, building the universal which sometimes is mistaken or deliberately confused with the Enlightenment's universal on the foundations of its technology and its language, the English language. And the accounting system, which has its origins in India, was completely adopted to that new mode of structuring uh, number, intervals, words, and it was structured in such a way that it had a kind of um, versatility kind of elasticity. It could yield all the time to the realities of power equations wherever they arose. And often they were elsewhere. Like at the moment, it's probably New York and Tel Aviv, or Liechtenstein, Macau, Sydney, very far away from where it is centered which is obviously still London. Well, Calcutta, which was the second city of the empire, has those semicircular Doric ventilators and looking at them, sometimes our imagination goes back to uh, the monument, monu monumentality of London and through it back to the classical Roman, Greco-Roman architecture. As I left Bishop Lefroy Road, uh, I felt a kind of lightness the, the sky was turning from blue to gold as I walked on the streets and thought after that meeting of how we may find yet another song of the road. The masculine columns can support the weight of history, I thought, while the undulations of hills and valleys glisten within our volcanic beings, wrapped in the softest of tissues. Bounced light again, yes, I thought. 
And here is a quote from Shubhrata Mitra, whom I had met several times before I met Manikda one to one. So Shubhrata had said that he had, had to ado adopt the lighting method in 1956 first while shooting Aparajito. After photographing the exteriors in Banaras, he planned to build, they planned to build the set of the home with the courtyard in Calcutta in the exterior of the studio lot to get the character of the shadowless, diffused light on that set. It was a typical thing in the actual old houses in Banaras with very little or no direct sunlight reaching the rooms throughout the day. Uh, it is a kind of light which can uh, create a mood with the slightest change uh, of gait and uh, a pirouette of the feet. Now, Shubhrata, on the other hand, seems to think that it is uh, something which has to be done to match the outdoors of one house. This is interesting. So look at the way the narratological progression becomes important to them rather than the, the, um, the nature of the light which is created by a certain social situation, certain architecture. And of course there was this awareness that photographing the interiors in the studio with common studio lights would produce this whole lot of unwanted double shadows on the set walls and on the floor, which are a headache for anybody. That would look very false whenever they would be intercut with the shots taken in the lanes in which we had captured the typical quality of light, Subrata had said. The solution was Mount Slighting. A white sheet of cloth above, which acted like a fake sky, and then the advancement in Kodak's fast film, I think it was Triax. I must say something about the set, Shubhra went on to say. If the set was not as good and realistic, I'm sure I would not have achieved that illusion of reality. So the aim was to achieve a kind of illusion of reality. That trio worked together with a firm belief that the trio of Manikda, Shubhutada, and Bansi Chandragupta. I think that it is their togetherness that helped Indian cinema achieve a certain kind of gentle but not too, not too soft, not too overwhelming, excessive type of storytelling and the opening up of new avenues seem to be round the corner which they themselves were not quite aware of. It is worth examining the statement that Shubhra made, that and other statements, our conversations that we had.
I can't, of course, tell you all in one go, but uh, synoptically, let me say that those that followed them had naturally to find their own idiom even as they remembered, as we remembered, let's say, because I followed them too, all the time those heart-wrenching scenes in the beginning sequences of Aparajito and Apursansar. They are poignant not because of just the bride finding sorrow in, in the home that she has to create herself, like in Apur Sansar, or in any other storytelling event. They are important, those scenes, because of the evocations of a certain mode of existence. That's why they are poignant. And Manikda and Shubhutada, I think, were both very, very full of gratitude to Bansi for creating the reality of a collective imaginary, not a reality which is just there outside. It is there as a mental space, which makes even a passing shot within that space acquire a certain mood a certain kind of, uh, you know, um, emotional exchange between the viewer and that image which forms itself in front of him. I think we have to keep in mind whatever we do, the signs of that collective imaginary that are found all around us. One of my great teachers was uh, Didi Kosambi. I'm speaking from a room in Pune now, and Didi Kosambi uh, used to be often having a walk with me here very near this room. And even as I speak of the collective imaginary, I remember him for having discovered uh, history at the doorstep as a methodology on its own. And this you find, especially uh, almost in every sound you hear, in the spaces that we create through our movement, the way we wear our garments, or we design modes of address, the friendships get formed, the love affairs that happen, the aspirations that one has for one's children, everything comes together. If we have a sense of the collect collective imagination, which is of some palpable, experienced reality, not just in a concrete sense of the other of reality out there, going beyond it to the emotional and the subjective. The sets as well as the locations selected for such a narrative are absolutely crucial to the graph that any uh, sequence can have, whether it be in music or in cinema or indeed the mise-en-scene. We have to remember that Bansi was the only professional in the trio that created Pather Panchali. The other two had never worked uh, on a film. Neither Manikda nor Shubhratada. 
he was the only professional in that trio, Bansida, that set out to reincarnate the world of Apu. Cinema is a play of dimensionalities. You know, we cannot just speak of three dimensions or four dimensions anymore. We are now capable of imagining n dimensions to every moment, to every event, to every mode of existence, to all our experience. These dimensionalities are awakened in our consciousness, a little like the Leela that our Vaishnav literature proposes. The music, the dance, the laikari, the resonances thereof, and then there's this Buddhist art tradition which renders all this to us in every mode of pleasure and pain, emphasizing the transient and not concretizing it into either a metaphysical thing, otherworldly, or a physical thing, thisworldly, or a biological being, but moving from one state to another of pleasure, pain, thought, and consciousness, and triggering emotions which we cannot be happy just to name or recognize. This has to find something beyond the illusion of reality. We have to go beyond recognition that we go beyond identification as well, beyond ethnicity, and move towards compassion in action. You have to see it in everything. The swirl of the lower garment in the dervishes movement, the spontaneous giving of a tree, a leaf, a flower, of a child, even the redundancy of dust, pollen, drops of water, the excess in nature. I had separate conversations with the trio over and over again on this score with Bansi, with Manikta, with Shubrato, but I could barely ever convince them of this viewpoint. They did carry on saying that seeing is believing. Bansi was introduced to me by KK, my nearest associate, my closest friend from the FTI days, that is from 1963, right up to the first decade of this century, when he went away. I obviously listened to a great deal with him, sharing it with him as he stood by me and shared the vision that I had. Earlier, the only persons I had met from the Pathir Panchali team was Shorbhujaya or Karuna Banerjee, that is at the Film Institute where I had met KK as well. She was introduced me to by Ritikta himself at the classroom theater. That's where I had met Anup first. Anup Singh, who has to today invited me to give this talk. Karunadi and her little daughter Shampa, who acted as the little Durga in Patra Panchali, always seemed to be freer of the trio, that is, Bansi. Shubrato and Manikta, freer of that ideology of illusion and reality, they were willing to listen to other points of view rather than be imprisoned by the binary that blocked Satyajit Ray, the filmmaker, from being Manikta, the elder brother. He had chosen in the very first letter that he wrote to me to sign it as Manikta, although I had written to him and addressed him as Satyajit Ray, chairman of the society which governs the Film Institute. My Maya Darpan was seen as a challenge to the language of cinema. It was so perhaps 
not only to him, but to those others who believe that one has to create not something to be read, but something you have to identify with. And through a process of identification, begin to emote with it, in it, around it. And find a catharsis, a purging of those noble emotions of pity and compassion, as well as that of protection from the evil eye, I guess, from metaphysical evil, from fate which one always begins to find all around us in states of paranoia and fear. That's the way the world is made. Nevertheless, this trio continued to be interested in the kind of direction that the young were taking, sometimes with alarm, mostly with alarm, but sometimes with a questioning which the young wanted to bring to their threshold. And Bansi was always the first person to inform me of the accolades that I had not seen myself coming from elsewhere. I think Calcutta and this trio in particular was always in touch with the the intellection, the artistic uh, work that was being conducted in the Western world, far more than we were in Bombay, at least in the sphere of uh, that which had a kind of literary base. In Bombay, uh, people were far too preoccupied with trade relations which uh, have led to the present day globalization and which were closing in on the poorer countries, almost enslaving us all over again. Well, Calcutta had its communist parties but the, the citizen did not uh, quite appreciate the importance of uh, thereby being in touch with the transactional, as it were. One of Satyajit's comments to me, perhaps when we were traveling together, happened to be on the same flight, was connected to the view that you get as you descend to Bombay. He said that Bombay stinks of money. I also knew that this was the attitude of several of his colleagues from the past, even though they had worked for multinational companies, of which there are plenty in Calcutta. Well, Bansi was different. He had given the clap for the first shot of Maya Darpan. He had done every wall of the former Alvar Maharaja's British mistress's house to the tint that I had specified. Got it approved each time weathered the walls to create the damp and its absence in the main location of the film. Bansi, KK and I would meet every evening at the Samovar in Bombay and often enough I would accompany them to the speakeasies in the suburbs. There was prohibition in Bombay. We could not drink openly. So they lived in the suburbs and I would join them and along with the converted East Indian community, which has a kind of Indo-Portuguese style of living on those mosquito-infested islands that were called thus by the Firangis. The glitterati 
were also around there. But we did not bump into them, excepting very, very occasionally when they would drop in for a bohemian night. Once, long after Maya Darpan and just before Tarang's shooting, Bansi, between sips of Indian-made foreign liquor, said to me, Kumar, anachronisms can illuminate a shot. He said it very suddenly, as though the thought had just occurred to him. I think he was quoting from one of his great predecessors of the silent era. I think perhaps that predecessor would be Herman Wom, who did the art direction both for the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and for the passion of Joan of Arc. What a wide difference between the two films. And uh, both of them pioneering in their own way. So when Bansi mentioned anachronisms and how they illuminate a shot, there was a kind of synesthetic effect that it set up. And my mind went from one thing to another, one sense to another. I thought of Shakespeare Sarani. I thought of Shakespeare himself. I thought of the Prince of Denmark wanting to be and not to be at the same time. I thought of Kalidas's luxurious rephrasing of the bold figures of speech and form that Shakuntala enunciated in the Mahabharata and the Mahabharata itself enunciated from the residues of the recited Rig Vedic and other cantatas. The bubbles of the soda that Bansi poured into his liquor were like the stars in his eyes. It was a kind of insight that he had had, perhaps, that moment. Perhaps the insight had come long before, but was only being acknowledged then, at that moment. The aspiration to structure cinema in the sparkle of the sonata that Manikta had was probably arising out of the desire to approximate cinema to dhvani itself, the original nad dhvani, anad nad, to reach an abstraction beyond the struck sound. The hemming in of experience by the consonant, which takes place in speech, uh, had to be avoided. And something else had to come into its place, the sound in itself, sonar, to avoid those notions of reality and illusion which are binary, which fix mental and physical space as separate. To conceive of intervals as not permanently fixed in time and space, but going beyond not to confuse those permanently fixed intervals either with the configurations in the sky that have measurements of light years between them. So I think one has to build sonatas and having built the sonatas, one has to build the landscape and having built the landscape, one has to take into account what it is in the skies that configurates and then gives us our way to destinations beyond. The layering of 
one kind of experience upon another finally is worthy of the creative act such as that of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Mind-boggling all this, isn't it? But it is equally mind-boggling that energy emerges from matter, absorbs matter itself in a way, and matter then reabsorbs it in irregularities and in random occurrences. On my first one-to-one -one meeting with Manikta at a friend's place in Bombay, I think it must have been in 1971, he had quizzed me closely on the flaws that he found in Bresson's work. Like the scene in which Mouchette breaks down while singing. Espere de l'espérance. I nodded. I said, perhaps you're right, Manikta. The notion of the false note is different in the tempered scale and here in India, which is not a tempered scale, it's a natural scale. So it was difficult, uh, perhaps, to uh, actually shoot that scene with the little girl, Mouchette. Not too little, she was also a pubescent girl, like Durka. But I'm not in a position to judge whether it is the realization that failed and why, or it was a fault in the script itself. Satyajit Ray's position in the early 1970s in Calcutta had become very insecure, as had perhaps of everyone in his position, in, in his, with his stature. Thus, when our first person-to-person -person meeting occurred, I was working on the script of Maya Dharpan at the time, hoping to explore the gifts of chromatic detail in our history, sound, movement, and color. Satyajit was conscious, curious about what was going on in my mind. He had even asked some of my technician colleagues if I were the same person who had asked him in 1965 what brought about the change in his stylistics in Charulata, to which he had replied that he had a good trolley. Everyone clapped and laughed at that time, except perhaps Lindsay Anderson, an old friend of his, who urged him to answer the Ernest Young student and to tell him truly what it was, the change in his statistics. No clear answer has ever been given, though everyone knew that even the Victorian Bhadralok had to cede to the charms of Madhavi, wine as sweet as honey, made of it. Well, even wine has to be kept with care. After Charulata, the surprise was that he had moved on to the journalist, journalistic mode, even though uh, he kept speaking about the perennial, which is obviously non-journalistic, because journalistic, the journalistic mode makes you think of that particular day when you're shooting 
when you're scripting, when you're editing. It has to be in tune with the times, in a sense, or it has to examine what the tune of the time is. There may have been also anxieties around the breakup of his team because Shubhratu and he were not going to make films together anymore. Nor would Bansi be around all the time as he had shifted to Bombay. I find it extremely ironical that in that state of mind he found that uh, the perennial could still be defended. And in that state of mind that he was, he was also beginning to uh, accept the generation gap. Why should we accept the generation gap? It is an invention of an economy which depends far too much on technological change without enough of a change in the social fabric or indeed the truth of evolution being a rather slow process. I've been having um, an interesting discussion with a person who's recording this talk, the sound recordist here, since yesterday. And he has two several comments that he has made. Uh, reconfirmed my belief that we cannot expect from new technologies the same limits of uh, limits of the sense of sound or picture or any other form of imaging as we may from the newest and the oldest and so on. Because there is a kind of perenniality to our ways of hearing and seeing and sensing in every way, which has developed through millions of years. It cannot be that within a generation or within a few years, the technologies will be able to change change our way of looking at things. It's not possible, you know. It's millions of years that has produced this very curious and wonderful processing of information. And this very idea that this is a processing of information is just, a, just about a century old at the most. It is not a process of information alone. It is the way whereby we um, find ourselves through the cinema, through music, through the arts, through science itself. So every second day, if the technology is going to or every second generation for that matter, is the technology going to be able to uh, allow uh, an erosion of our sensibilities which are governed by our evolution by so many millions of years. But in generation after generation, at least since the First World War, which is over a hundred years ago, which ended over a hundred years ago, uh, 
there has been a pressure to accept a war of generations, as it were, without a change of social fabric. And it has wreaked havoc upon people, separating families, couples, the young and the old. And finally, reduced individuals to solitary loneliness, which can only produce a psychotic state of mind, along with all its anxieties. And this has been further compounded by the surveillance that has increased due to the change in, in information collection. As the space given to the individual becomes narrower and narrower, the world seems uninhabitable. Was Manikta helplessly sensing his isolation when he started acknowledging that Ritikda's film Nagarik would have been accepted as the first film of alternate cinema in India had it been released before Pathar Panchali. His helplessness vis-a-vis -vis the market was something that he never fully confronted. I had seen the script of the alien later to be made as E.T., I believe, in a London office of an American film producer. I had taken a message from the producer to Manikda, inviting him to make the film extravagantly. He said to me that you please tell Manikda that he can make a film without any constraints of the monetary kind that he has had thus far. And in fact, we want him to do so. We want him to design shots where the camera is placed in a ditch and an airplane comes and crashes into the lenses. I told him that I don't think Manikda will accept this. Similarly, I believe that the French were persuading him to take his time over the production of the film funded by them. I was in Calcutta when that film was being completed and he had told me of the difficulties that he had faced with his own health. Uh, and I wish he could have agreed to take a little more time over that film. But he was always very, very conscious about what he would call viability, financial viability. Almost overconscious of that. And uh, when he accepted the Oscar, literally on his deathbed, I felt extremely uh, sad that somebody who means a lot to all of us had to say at that time that he had always wished that, wished to get an Oscar. This was on his deathbed. So it was uh, quite amazing that uh, the market, as it were, had waited for so long. And in the meantime, even probably hijacked other projects of his to give to him the Oscar. Publicly, he seemed 
to uh, assert his ascent of the system. In great contrast to his own more complex, more elegant formulations whenever I met him alone. He would not have wanted to be an author if uh, he thought that uh, economic viability or financial viability is the first thing that the younger generation should think of over and above their own their own desire to make a film, own desire to write a poem. But I feel that these kind of misunderstandings should be now uh, cleared and um, there are signs that I see around which make me feel that the individual might begin to find a community which responds and does not uh, just throw back ostracize the individual, the author, to throw him out of that society. One of the good things I've heard in the last week is that a young woman filmmaker, dissenter, one of our own kind, as it were, because some of you here are from the Film Institute. And most of you here for example, are young people who are uh, listening to me now, even uh, making these images, these very ones, that one of these dissenters has been awarded at Cannes, that is Payal Kapadia, and that uh, she is known to be a dissenter. I've, I've known her when uh, she was growing up from, from being a child. And uh, Once I came to the Film Institute and found her, uh, this little girl who had grown up on my street, here in a class that I was addressing. And later I'd heard that there were the authorities at the Film Institute were trying to discipline her for, <laughs> for wanting to, um, to uphold the values that the Film Institute has always had. I think she will. I think other people will do that also. And I hope that we will not have any more of the situation that Hussein Saab had faced, for example. He had to live the last years of his life in exile. I hope that Anoop, who has invited me here and who was my student earlier, will get more accolades as well and will be able to live wherever he is. So also Payal, when she comes back, I hope she does not have to suffer authoritarian individuals or authoritarian systems which kill initiatives of the young. And more than that, The systems have now been wired into our modes of looking at things, you know. 
certain kinds of ways are now being denied of access to that reality or the reading of that reality. And this is through language, this is through also the kind of imaging that you do. Because some ways of hearing themselves, some ways of seeing are being cut off from us. The present tense is, has become supreme, the infinitive has become supreme. The imperative has become supreme. You know, we are being ordered, just like machines are ordered, with the press of a button to do certain things. And we are ourselves getting into that mode. So that will naturally mean that this dependence on technology rather than on the questioning of that technology uh, will completely enslave, completely exclude the persons who, who desire, who want to come into play with one another, even with the creation of the software each time, you know, for that play to happen, one has to have those kinds of declensions that our classical languages had, for example. You know, they are, they are more versatile than the modes that we are given now. Our classical languages like Sanskrit had not only the singular and the plural, but the dual also, you know, as a mode of address. I'm sure other languages would have also had many, many different ways of approaching reality. And it was always uh, my intention in, in all the conversations that I had with Manikta and his associates to listen, to be able to listen to the other. Only then authorship makes some sense, the idea of authorship, the idea that each person has the right to breathe the way the person wants to, you know. Of course, the right to breathe means that you should be uh, first acknowledging that th this is the way you move from one note to another. This is the way you kiss, you know. This is the way you come close to another. This is the way you distance, keep your social distance when it is necessary. You know, we are all wearing masks these days because of that. But if we do not allow that and instead give us, ourselves and the others, a kind of seal of approval to a singular notion of reality or to its illusion, then nothing will work. I think uh, I cannot go into details of this today, but all three of them, that is, Manikta, Bansi, Shubrato had begun to understand that each one of us should be allowed to develop 
our own cognition along with that of the other. And I cannot speak about it now, but someday I will be able to uh, perhaps uh, go over what um, Shubrato had told me of his experience that made him and his directors part ways when they had to stop working together and it seems to me that we should learn once again from their experience to be uh, people of uh, greater accommodation to one another, that we should learn above all to come together to do things. And even that is being sabotaged over and over again by a new version of Rob Robinson Crusoe or the perfectly uh, so-called self-sufficient independent individual in the neoliberal economy. I hope you get over all that and work with one another, enjoy life together, and destroy that state, the globalized economy state, which promises everything and del delivers only loneliness. Thank you. There's a quotation from Abol Tabol, which was written by Manik Das' father. The holes you find in wood, the old man said, have reason to be there. They are caused, and no one knows this yet, by cobwebs in the air. Let me now, at the end, say that I doff my hat to all of you who are here making these images, audiovisual, sound and picture. Let me say that I want to thank you because it's through your intervention that whatever I've said will reach anywhere. And let me doff my hat that I never wear to those that help me think through this affair, especially Amol Kode, Rimli Bhattacharya, and Pushpendra. Thank you.